order. I'd like to welcome everyone here today for this very timely hearing on the Department of Defense Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Policy and Programs for fiscal year 2018. The pursuit and potential use of weapons of mass destruction remains a high consequence threat to our national security. To date, the Department of Defense efforts to prevent, protect against, and respond to weapons of mass destruction threats have kept the use of these weapons low. Despite these efforts, recent media reports of chemical weapons use in Iraq and Syria, continued nuclear weapons development in North Korea, and the asymmetric use of nerve agent remind us the threat is real, global in nature, and potentially growing. A key challenge in countering this threat is that many technologies that are used for peaceful civilian purposes can also potentially be used for developing weapons of mass destruction. Emerging examples of these dual-use technologies are in the fields of synthetic biology and gene editing. Rapidly developing biotechnologies that are easily obtained present new threats to the warfighter that we have yet to fully understand. Today's hearing will allow our subcommittee to provide critical oversight on ensuring that the department's countering weapons of mass destruction policies, plans, and programs sufficiently address these emerging threats. Let me now turn to Ranking Member Jim Langevin of Rhode Island for any opening comments he'd like to make. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and I want to thank our witnesses for being here today. Uh, Dr. Hopkins and uh, uh, Mr. Vega, it's very nice to see you here, and, uh, and uh, Mr. Hand, great to, great to be with you for the first time, so thank you. Um, before I give the rest of my opening statement, though, I do want to take a minute to acknowledge uh, Ms. Katie Sutton, uh, a Sandia National Laboratory Fellow uh, that has been on HASC uh, for the last two years. Uh, Katie returns to Sandia to work uh, on cyber programs next week. During her tenure on HASC, Katie has been a tremendous asset uh, and has worked uh, in a bipartisan fashion, particularly on CWMB uh, issues. Uh, she has many accomplishments to be proud of such as the biodefense strategy provision in the fiscal year 2017 NDAA, on which she was the lead. Katie, I just want to say thank you for your hard work on behalf of the ETC subcommittee and wish you well. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Well, today uh, we meet to review the efforts by the Department of Defense to address the threat of weapons of mass destruction. Uh, this is an important topic for oversight by the subcommittee, and I look forward to hearing about the policies and programs at the Department of Defense to counter this threat. During this uh, past year, we have continued to receive media reports of the use of these weapons, including the use of chemical weapons by ISIS uh, in Iraq uh, and Syria, and the use of VX uh, nerve agent by North Korea. These reports illustrate the importance of robust efforts to protect the services and the nation from this continually evolving threat. Last fall, the agency formerly uh, known as the Joint Improvised uh, Threat Defeat Agency, or JAIDA, uh, was transitioned to the Joint Improvised uh, Threat Defeat Organization, GAEDO, uh, within the uh, Defense Threat Reduction Agency. These, uh, this change offers the opportunity to achieve savings through common efficiencies and a leverage synergy in the organization's missions. Efficiencies and synergy include streamlining the command structure of GAEDO uh, to align with DITRA, consolidating human resources and other overhead functions, and reducing mission and program overlap in order, in order to focus JADO on its core task uh, and to avoid mission creep. It is important that we continue to evaluate the Department's programs and efforts to ensure they are efficiently and effectively meeting the requirements uh, of our warfighters. Over the last few years, uh, we have been uh, briefed by the Department on Constellation, a prototype of a new CWMD uh, situation awareness technology. I certainly look forward to hearing what efforts the Department has been uh, taking uh, to work with Special Operations Command, uh, which has uh, recently taken over the mission for global synchronization for countering weapons of mass destruction, to understand the requirements of the, uh, the Commander and leverage any existing systems uh, to meet these needs. Finally, the confluence of the fiscal year 2017 uh, end of year appropriations, uh, fiscal year 27 supplemental request, and fiscal year 2018 budget outline have no doubt created challenges in executing and planning programs. So I would like to ask our witnesses to talk about the day-to-day -day challenges of uncertainty uh, and their priorities when all three uh, of these uh, funding re mechanisms. With that, uh, I, I thank you, you again to our witnesses for appearing before us today, and uh, I am sure I yield back the balance of my time. 
We have before us a panel of three distinguished witnesses. Dr. Arthur Hopkins, Acting Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear, Chemical, and Biological Defense Programs. Mr. Peter Verga, performing the duties of Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense and Global Security. And Ms. Sherry Durand, Acting Director of, the, of DITRA, De, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. While detailed budget numbers for fiscal year 2018 are not available at this time, we look forward to a robust discussion on the policies and programs in place in the Department for Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction in 2018. Welcome to all of our witnesses. I'd like to remind you that your testimony will be included in the record, and we ask that you summarize key points from that testimony in five minutes or less. And before we begin with Dr. Hopkins, I also would like to take a moment to rec recognize Katie Sutton, who will be returning to Sandia National Laboratories, having completed her two-year fellowship with our committee. Katie has been an integral part of our team and helped us legislate and conduct oversight in many important and complex complex areas. Indeed, many of the same things we plan on discussing today. Katie, thank you for your hard work over the past two years, and we wish you continued success. And with that, Dr. Hopkins, we can begin with you, and we look forward to your opening statement. Thank you, Chairwoman Stefanik, Ranking Member Langevin, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I appreciate this opportunity to testify on the Department's efforts to counter threats posed by weapons of mass destruction. The Office of the Assistant Secretary for Nuclear, Chemical, and Biological Defense Programs has roots that go back to the establishment of the department. When it was focused primarily on nuclear deterrence, since then, the organization's responsibilities have expanded to include nuclear, chemical, and biological defense programs, which are carried out by four organizations within the NCB enterprise. Our Nuclear Matters Office is the focal point for DOD activities and initiatives for sustaining a safe, secure, and effective nuclear deterrent. Our chemical and biological defense program develops capabilities that enable warfighters to deter, prevent, protect, mitigate, respond to, and recover from traditional and emerging threats. Through our Threat Reduction and Arms Control Office, our oversight of the nation's chemical demilitarization program focuses on the safe, complete, and treaty-compliant destruction of the nation's remaining chemical weapons stockpile. In addition, we ensure DOD compliance with nuclear, chemical, and biological treaties and agreements. And our Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Systems Program strengthens situational awareness of global WMD activities. The Defense Threat Reduction Agency addresses the full spectrum of WMD-related threats, including cooperative threat reduction programs and support to combat commands, as well as threats from improvised devices. Today, I'd like to highlight some of the enduring and the emerging challenges and threats in each area, the ongoing activities that we're conducting to address those challenges, and our priorities moving forward. To counter current and emerging threats like those enabled by synthetic biology and non-traditional agents, the Chemical and Biological Defense Program is developing new strategies to anticipate, prepare, and more rapidly respond, especially in the area of medical countermeasures, in addition to developing protective equipment and detection systems. In domestic chemical demilitarization, the Department continues to make significant progress in meeting the nation's commitments under the Chemical Weapons Convention by working toward eliminating the last of our remaining chemical weapons stockpiles in Colorado and Kentucky. In September 16, the Department started agent destruction operations at the Pueblo, Colorado site. At Bluegrass, Kentucky, facility construction is complete and destruction systems are being tested. With the United States Special Operations Command's new leadership role in countering weapons of mass destruction mission, we've engaged closely with them to understand their mission needs for global situational awareness. WMD threat reduction programs executed by the Defense Threat Reduction Agency continue to reduce the threat of weapons of mass destruction around the world by detecting and preventing proliferation and consolidating, securing, and eliminating dangerous pathogens and materials of concern. These efforts are conducted in cooperation with partners throughout the world as they enhance their own capacity to secure WMD materials, detect and interdict pro proliferation, and respond to WMD-related events. WMD threats are real. The Department's activities to help reduce these threats include the full spectrum of countering weapons of mass destruction activities, from preventing acquisition to containing and reducing threats to supporting crisis response. I want to thank you for this opportunity to testify and also thank you for your enduring interest and support to these important mission areas.
Thank you, Mr. Verga. Chairwoman Stefanik, Ranking Member Langevin, members of the committee, again, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm honored to be here with Dr. Hopkins and Ms. Duran to present the Department's approach to countering chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear threats. Since the Department testified before the subcommittee on this subject one year ago, two CBRN-related threats have dominated the headlines, those posed by North Korea and the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or ISIS, both highlight the complex nature of the threat we face. The North Korean regime has increased its dangerous and provocative CBRN-related activities over the past year. It's continued to test nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles in clear violation of multiple United Nations Security Council resolutions. ISIS poses a different sort of CBRN threat as a non-state actor, not bound by long-standing norms and laws, and with a demonstrated willingness to use chemical weapons against civilians and combatants alike. While ISIS capabilities are currently far less sophisticated than North Korea's, its willingness to use and potentially proliferate CBRN-related materials or knowledge to its affiliates elsewhere is of grave concern. The Department's strategic approach to countering these threats focuses on three lines of effort, preventing acquisition of WMD, containing and reducing threats, and mitigating the consequences of potential use. Our efforts to address these threats for North Korea and ISIS reflect this approach. To prevent the transfer of CBRN or dual-use materials to and from North Korea, the Department works closely with interagency partners, in part through outreach under the Proliferation Security Initiative, or PSI, to the 104 other PSI endorsees committed to preventing WMD proliferation. Ship with committed allies and partners are foundational to our success. We also engage with partners through the DOD Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, which remains, in the words of Secretary of Defense Mattis, the Department's most comprehensive and effective tool for working cooperatively with partners to mitigate CBRN-related threats. Through DITRA's capable implementation, CTR is engaged in over 30 countries, helping them detect, secure, or eliminate CBRN-related materials and pathogens of security concern. These efforts are integrated with those of our interagency partners. In Southeast Asia, CTR is building the capabilities of our partners to detect and prevent maritime proliferation of CBRN-related materials, such as those headed to or from North Korea. Despite our best efforts at prevention, we must be prepared to contain and reduce CBRN threats once they have developed. For instance, to contain and reduce the CBRN threats from ISIS, the U.S. and our coalition partners are also exploiting opportunities on the ground to better understand and disrupt their CW networks. The, D excuse me, the DOD CTR program is also strengthening Jordan's and Lebanon's capacity to prevent proliferation of CBRN materials from Iraq and Syria into their territories, and to ensure that ISIS affiliates in Libya do not acquire or proliferate a CBRN capability. We supported interagency efforts to remove chemical precursors from Libya and initiated a proliferation prevention program with the government of Tunisia along its border with Libya. Elsewhere, DOD is working with our key regional allies, the Republic of Korea and Japan, to ensure that our focus remains postured to respond to CBRN contingencies or emanating from the Korean Peninsula. Complementing those engagements in the CBRN Preparedness Program, or CP2, which engages bilaterally with our partner nations to respond to and mitigate effects of a CBRN incident. In addition to being prepared to respond to events overseas, DOD must ensure we are prepared to support the federal response to a domestic CBRN incident at home. Working closely with the joint staff, we continue to partner with a wide array of interagency partners, including the Departments of Homeland Security, Energy, and Justice to ensure a coordinated response to any event in the homeland. In conclusion, the acquisition or use of CBRN weapons against the United States, our forces, or our interests remains among the most dangerous threats we face. With your support, the Department will continue to strengthen our capabilities and relationships to reduce these threats at home and abroad. Again, thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Rand. Chairwoman Stefanik, Ranking Member Langevin, and members of the subcommittee, 
It is an honor to be here today to share with you the work of the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. DITRA makes the United States and our allies safer by countering threats posed by the proliferation and use of weapons of mass destruction. While not a direct focus of today's hearing, DITRA also has a new mission area, countering improvised explosive devices and other improvised threats. Last October, the department transitioned the Joint Improvised Threat Defeat Organization, JIDO, under the authority, direction, and control of DITRA. DITRA is a unique organization with a broad portfolio that is accomplished by an incredibly capable and talented workforce. We are very proud of some recent milestones, including the accomplishments of the Nunn-Luger Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, which celebrated its 25th anniversary last December. And this coming April, we will celebrate the 70th anniversary of DITRA's Defense Nuclear Weapons School located in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Our expertise spans the full spectrum of WMD threats, chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear weapons, and high-yield explosives. We are a one-stop shop, open 24 hours a day to support the department's functional and geographic combatant commands, the military services, and the interagency. Over the past three years, DITRA moved to a regional vice programmatic approach against WMD threats. This allows us to support warfighters and allies with more comprehensive and integrated methods that are better aligned with the combatant commands. Likewise, our regional approach ensures a more holistic prioritization of the science and technology that DITRA pursues and a better understanding of how we transition those capabilities to the warfighter and military services. In Iraq and Syria, ISIS is using chemical weapons on the battlefield. Thankfully, the authorities and funding that Congress provides DITRA each year allows us to support Operation Inherent Resolve and respond to these and other emerging long-term WMD <coughs> challenges. I am proud of what our team has accomplished this past year and believe that we serve as good stewards of taxpayers' dollars. As we look toward fiscal year 2018, I am confident that we are prepared to address future WMD and improvised threats around the world. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Rand. Um, the, my first question is, the FY17 NDAA authorized funding for many critical activities within the Chemical and Biological Defense Program, the Chemical Demilitarization Program, and at DITRA. What have been the impacts of the continuing resolution, the CR, so far this fiscal year? And can you describe the impacts to your programs for a full year CR for fiscal year 2017? Dr. Hopkins. Thank you, Chair Chairwoman, for the question. Um, we are uh, making it work uh, because it's, it is the reality of the budget situation, but it, the uh, continuing resolution really limits our ability to do longer-term planning uh, because of the way the funds come in in, in increments. And so I would say that uh, the nature of the people who do the work for us is such that they will make, they will make the programs work given the constraints. However, it does limit our ability to plan and adapt, uh, especially if things come up in uh, near term or medium term that require different levels of funding. Uh, the continuing resolution doesn't allow that. So it, it's a, it does tie our hands a bit. Mr. Verga? I'd, I would just uh, go along with what Dr. Hopkins said. It's, uh, it's obviously always better to have a full, full year budget uh, appropriation because it does allow you to, to implement a program that you've laid out in an orderly fashion um, you know, given what you expected to get in the appropriations that were asked for, asked for in the budget and a CR, it just trips you up when you get started and you can't really, can't really do what you need to do. And Ms. Durand. Give you a couple of specifics from an agency perspective. Uh, one, it more than doubles our workload. Uh, when you do incremental funding, as the CR funding comes in, we're having to incrementally fund all of our contracts. So that means for the contracting staff, who is already overworked, they are in essence doubling their work throughout the year. That also adds to our comptroller support office, um, who are also having to do a lot of um, uh, accounting uh, and other budgetary actions when the department is working very ho hard towards our financial improvement and audit readiness. So it's just part of that is just a workload capacity. As Dr. Hopkins said, we will get it done. Um, but at a time when we need everybody more focused on direct mission support, that makes it difficult. For us specifically, another one uh, that we encountered uh, when JIDO came under us, one of the things we didn't expect was in the, um, the 16 budget, 
was with the Army because the Army was the executive agent for JIDA. Because of the continuing resolution, that funding was appropriated to the Army, uh, and it, was, it did not come directly to DITRA. So again, that means the accounting and the budgetary means it has to go on if the money goes to the Army, we have to get it from the Army, we have to do uh, double budgeting and a lot of uh, budgetary transfers in our books. So it just makes it very complicated. Thank you very much. It's important for us to get on the record the negative impacts that a continued CR would have on the DOD. So thank you for those thoughtful answers. Uh, my second question is for Dr. Hopkins. Recent technological advances in the areas of synthetic biology and gene editing have created a bio-revolution that has increased the capability and availability of biotechnology. Last fall, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology released a report on this topic that concluded, quote, just as rapid advances in biotechnology have increased the risk of misuse by bad actors, they have expanded the tools available to protect the public. How is the DOD responding to the emerging threat faced by these new technologies, and can the department apply these new technologies to counter the potential threat? Thank you, Chairman, for the question. You're absolutely right. This is uh, the new technologies really are a double-edged sword. Uh, one of the challenges we have is in addressing, in looking at the potential uh, potential effects on national security. We want to make sure that uh, the things that we do uh, to try to protect ourselves don't interfere with the development of the application of the technology for peaceful, useful uh, purposes. And so that, combined with the fact that it is an emerging uh, area, uh, really ca causes us to step back and, and try to understand what, what will be the, or what could be the potential national security impacts of, uh, of synthetic biology. We have asked the National Academy of Sciences to, uh, to step in and help us uh, in an interagency study to look at the potential impacts on security. Uh, about what time frame would we expect uh, potential nefarious uh, capabilities to be available to, to bad actors, and what can we do about it. And uh, the things that we would do about it really fall into at least three areas. Uh, the ability to know, it, know what's happening in the first place, because if we're talking about a biological threat, uh, how do you know what it is? How do you know, how do you know it's appeared? And so we're working very hard on detection technologies to understand when and if uh, we may be subject to those kinds of, uh, those kinds of uh, attacks. Protection is a second area. Uh, as you know, the classic chemical biological protection is a mask, a suit, a glove, an individual protection, collective protection, that sort of thing. We have to make sure that our science base is up to the task and actually performing capabil developing capabilities to protect the warfighter. And so challenging uh, the, the things that we have on hand now that are classical uh, in the face of those kinds of threats is very important. Third area is mitigation. What are we going to do about it? And uh, since we're talking about biological side of things, medical countermeasure development is, is right at the forefront. The same tools, uh, synthetic biology, uh, that we're concerned about as being capable of being used against us, uh, we are also using in the laboratories to help to develop uh, countermeasures. And so uh, our ability to come up with vaccines, therapeutics, uh, even, uh, even laboratory uh, uh, equipment that will help identify what the threat is, very important to us. And so those three areas, detection, protection, and uh, medical countermeasures and mitigation are, are the places where we are investing uh, to try to counter that. Thank you, Dr. Hopkins. I now recognize Mr. Langevin. Again, uh, thank you, our witnesses, again, for, for being here. Uh, Ms. Duran, if I could start with you. Uh, JIDA was an organization that uh, continually evolved and, and had an uncertain future. As I mentioned uh, in my opening statement, the alignment of JIDO uh, under DITRA should result in both synergy and efficiencies as well as provide an opportunity to focus JIDO uh, on its core mission and define its future. So I wanted to know what synergies are there between DITRA and, and JIDO, uh, what uh, efficiencies have been achieved as a result of the realignment, and how is the department using uh, the alignment as an opportunity to focus JIDO uh, on its core mission and the size and scope the organization for that mission to achieve maximum effectiveness. And finally, has the term improvised threat been defined? So if you want to repeat any of those, I threw a lot at you, I'd be glad to. So. Thank you for those questions. Um, two weeks ago, we briefed um, uh, the staffers on highlighting all the efficiencies that we have uh, uh, gained since 
uh, Jido came under us. I, I would preface all my uh, comments with, it really has only been since October. So we spent, after the decision was made last January, uh, up until October when they officially came under us, spending a lot of time getting every ready, uh, everything ready to come under us. That was an enormous challenge, just getting um, 235 Jido civilian employees transferred from the Army um, into DITRA. Um, one of the first things that we did is we have consolidated eight of the offices that were previously in JIDO. Those are the ones that you touched on, uh, human resources, inspector general contracts, comptroller, general counsel, legislative and public affairs, security and counterintelligence. JIDO at the time was standing up to be its own defense agency, so those offices were standing up. Um, so we just took those offices and those individuals and merged them into ours. Um, and so we're moving forward with, um, they have entirely new systems that they have to learn. Um, so we're, we're spending a lot of time getting them up to speed. Um, you had mentioned in your opening comments about the um, uh, senior structure. So JIDO previously had four senior executive service members. One of those was a term appointment. So that's been, uh, that ended. So we're at least, we are working on recognizing the need to, to shrink that senior leadership uh, level down. So we're, we are pushing towards that. Um, the efficiency, so uh, two key areas that we're looking at in information technology and our research and development uh, capacities. Uh, DITRA has a lot of uh, test bed capacity in our research and development test and, and evaluation world, uh, and JIDO will be able to use those um, test ranges, so that will uh, in time reduce their costs associated with test range costs, uh, so that's one specific thing. JIDO is very proficient and has a great deal of experience in information technology, especially how it supports the warfighter. So all their efforts that they have spent years developing uh, on situational awareness um, for improvised threats on attacking those networks, we're finding to be very helpful to us uh, in the CWMD community. So we are, um, especially in our IT worlds, they are working very much together to figure out what synergies that are there, what can we combine, what things may need to remain separate. We have also recognized in the committee's desire to show savings, um, we're, we are keeping track of those. I cannot sit here and tell you that we have gained a tremendous amount of savings. Uh, it, it takes quite a bit for this type of an integration. There are a lot of upfront costs and time that go into it. But we fully expect over a certain amount of time, and it may take a couple years, that we would be able to come back to you and show you specific metrics and dollar savings. One quick one I would give you is, when JIDA was going to stand up, they were going to have to um, buy uh, their uh, backroom human resources services. So that's the processing a lot of actions. Uh, they would have gained those services from the Defense Logistics Agency, um, which is a working capital uh, entity. So they would have been paying DLA for that support. So it was about $1.5 million. So that's a cost avoidance that they avoided with that, and now they're just merged in with ours. So we are seeing some savings, but I would expect them to grow over time. To your question on uh, focusing on the mission, so we, we do think that because they're now under DITRA, and they're not having to do all the things related to being a, a separate entity and a separate agency, they will benefit from all the structure that we have uh, in place already, so they don't have to be bothered with that. Um, to your specific question, is improvised threats defined well? No. Uh, you could use the term improvised threats, and that could be everything that goes on within the department. So we're continuing to, um, uh, to look at and to make sure that we're following, I think, the guidance the committee has been concerned about before of the mission creep. Good. I hope I addressed each one. You did. You hit them all. That's very good. Thank you very much. Um, uh, my time's expired. Hopefully we'll get to a second round. But yes. if not, um, I yield back. Thank you. Dr. Wenstrup. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Thank you all for being here today and very interesting and uh, concerning topic, as, as, you, as you well know. Um, Dr. Hopkins, I'm going to talk to you for a little bit. I look back at like uh, DOD response to the Ebola virus and our engagement there, and I think actually a lot to be proud of with that with that mission uh, in a challenging situation. I also look at the balance of the, of the Department of Defense or the military to serve in combat roles, and that's not a combat role, but we could be in a combat environment where there's an outbreak 
uh, of some entity like that that we have to be concerned with? And then where does uh, HHS come into play? And, and how do you see those, those roles? And do they cooperate? Uh, how are we engaging in that way? Uh, and what were the lessons learned from that mission? <clears throat> And thank you very much for the other question. Uh, the, I think the success of the defense, chemical biological defense program, is very, very much dependent on how well we coordinate with the other government stakeholders in this area, uh, Health and Human Services, uh, Homeland Security, CDC, National Institutes of Health, Agriculture. I mean, there are a number of government agencies, all of whom have a stake in, the, uh, in, this, in this area. Our focus is on biological threat agents, and so uh, in, in order to make sure that the warfighter has the, has the therapeutics and the diagnostics and, and the capabilities to know that they're under attack and, and, and even protect them with vaccines, uh, that, that's, I don't, I don't call it a niche, but that's, that's in a very important part, that's a lead part of what we do. Having said that, the science is science associated with developing those uh, those countermeasures, as well as the coordination on the on the basic science for this, is something that we have to share, and I think that happens very effectively uh, through a group called FEMSI, the Public Health Emergency Medical Countermeasures uh, Enterprise. It's uh, all the agencies that I just mentioned, uh, all coming together for primarily for the purpose of making sure that the nation has of uh, therapeutics and vaccines in the event of a natural outbreak, but we also leverage that capability to make sure that the, uh, the department has what, what it needs. Uh, as far as lessons learned from, uh, uh, from the Ebola outbreak, uh, I, to me the single largest lesson, lesson is that the department has a lot to offer. While we may not have the lead in a natural outbreak, the department has quite a capability to, that we can leverage and we can contribute to uh, natural outbreaks like that. Uh, Again, going back to the original, uh, uh, my original point, the number one lesson we learned is it's really, really important to be talking to and collaborating with the other government agencies who have a stake in the successful outcome of events like those. In, in that particular situation, you know, you, you don't know these outbreaks are coming. These are new viruses. Uh, I'm just curious how the military trains for that mission. I guess it, it, it's more generic training uh, and education as you roll out, I would imagine. Would, would that be the case? Uh, I think it's actually that, but it's also the, uh, the military laboratories, the, uh, the Navy mm -hmm. laboratories, the Army laboratories, uh, are always forward-looking and they're always coordinating with the civilian side to make sure that the, the military has the situational awareness and knows what capabilities are out there, our own and on the civilian side. So again, I think it comes down to the collaboration and the situational awareness that's provided by the leading edge researchers and developers, developers at the uh, at the service laboratories, and um, and the the coordination has been good in your opinion. Yes, it it has okay. been. Thank you, Mr. Ant. And um, if I could ask you real quickly, um, in the intelligence community, how's the cooperation between intelligence community and with what's going on? Uh, we'd always hate to hear that there wasn't conversation back and forth. Uh, do you feel like there's, there, there are any gaps there that we need to address? Should Congress be helping in any way in that regard? I will tell you that DITRA enjoys an incredibly strong partnership across the entire intelligence community. Um, I would also tell you that in the very short time that uh, U.S. South, uh, SOCOM uh, has had the uh, synchronization mission. Um, they have, they are so interwoven with the entire intelligence community. General Thomas in particular is very actively going after this in terms of what else does he need from the intelligence community for the CWMD mission. Um, and I have no doubt he will make great strides in, in, in that regard. Um, we've also experienced in some recent um, exercises that some of my folks have participated in. The feedback that I get from them is that they have never seen a time when there was more involvement and better partnership with the, uh, across the entire interagency with our allies and with the intelligence community. So I can't tell you that I see any gap. I can give you the assurance that if there is one, General Thomas will find it and he will correct it. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Ms. Gafford. Thank you very much. Um, prior to the first Gulf War, it was disclosed that Iraq had produced 19,000 liters of concentrated botulin A toxin to be used in weapons. 
given that one aerosolized gram of this toxin could potentially kill up to a million people, where would DTRA rank this toxin in terms of threat level where we are today? So that one I'm not sure, so I'd like to take that one for the record and get back to you so I give you the correct answer. Sure, I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, the, as you go through that follow-up, um, I'd be interested to see if there are any current programs or plans underway that recognize this threat and, and countermeasures to deal with it. Um, given that the FDA approval process for medical countermeasures can be lengthy and unpredictable, um, what kind of risk does that present to the DOD in, in wait times for FDA approvals for any countermeasures that we may need um, in a tighter timeline? Generally, not specifically for this toxin, but generally. So I'm going to do, Ditcher is not specifically involved in that piece of the process. I would defer to Dr. Hopkins on any sure. of those specifics. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me say that the uh, FDA uh, approval process is critically important and uh, to the successful production of, of uh, vaccines and therapeutics that, that we need. And so uh, having said that, uh, we are doing everything we can uh, to work with the FDA starting early in the process. Uh, we've learned uh, over the years that it's best to, to engage with the Food and Drug Administration very, very early so that we can, uh, we can understand the process as well as work with them in, in speeding things up. We also, through the, uh, through the uh, passing of the Cures Act, have, we in the department have uh, authority now to offer priority review vouchers and, and, and obtain orphan drug designations for some of our uh, low volume, uh, limited distribution uh, kind of products. And so mm -hmm. that, is, that is very, very helpful to us. Uh, in fact, uh, most recently, the plague vaccine uh, has received FDA orphan drug status, and uh, that was funded by the Chem Bio Defense Program. So uh, the bottom line is we are using whatever uh, means we can to accelerate and work very closely and early with the Food, Food and Drug Administration because we know that their involvement is important to the production of safe products. Understood. Thank you. I yield back. Dr. Abraham. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman. Thank the witnesses for being here. This is a vital topic, in my opinion. And Mr. Berger, thank you for your service in Vietnam. We appreciate that very much, sir. I'm going to pony a little bit off Dr. Winstrom and Chairwoman Stefanik and go back to the synthetic biology of, of all this nuclear, chemical, and biological things that do keep me awake at night. I think the biological is the one that I spend most of the time looking at the ceiling because it's cheap, it's available. And uh, as Dr. Winstrup alluded to, you could have a human vector to, trans, um, to transmit the pathogen. And to weaponize a virus or a bacteria with what you gentlemen know of, certainly you, Dr. Hopkins, with the CRISPR-Cas9 technology, the genetic engineering, which can be done now in a, any biochemical lab with a person of just normal intelligence that has a masters or certainly a PhD in, in that type of instance, this can become a real threat very quickly. My question, Dr. Hopkins, to you first, you said you were, and I understand, talking to state governments and the people in those agencies that we need to talk to, but we all know that if a terrorist organization wants to do this, we're not talking to them. Are there any, and I understand it's difficult, but are there any checks and balances today that at least can give us a little hint of something that may be coming because, as Ms. Gabbard said with the botulism, mitigation is not an option here because we're too far behind the power curve. So the question is, what's out there to stop this? And what can we as Congress do to help you accomplish that goal? Thank you, Congressman, for the question. Uh, the short answer is I'm not aware of a specific uh, action or uh, And I'm not either. That's why I asked the question. Right now, I'm but, not aware of any either. But I think what that does is it really uh, points to the importance of this study that we've commissioned with the National Academy of Sciences because 
as you and I think about this, we would, we would both conjure up notions of some really bad things that could happen in the hands of people who don't need a lot of training or a lot of equipment. It, it sounds like science fiction, but it's not. It's here. It, it does. Uh, what we've asked the Academy to do is kind of separate the science fiction from the reality and recognize what reality is today and help us to understand the national security implications. What is, what is the art of the possible in the near term, in the midterm, in the long term? As well as to uh, as well as to identify what can, what can we do about it? Uh, we know that the first step is detection. We know that first of all we got to know we're under attack, and so we we know that the laboratories are already thinking about ways they might be able to that we could detect a genetically modified version of some uh, some disease. So that's that's the starting point, and we're already working on that. But I really think the key to framing this, framing the whole potential threat, is uh, is the National Academy, the national experts. Thinking through this with the uh, with the assembly of the uh, the various stakeholders, health and human services, and homeland security, and so forth, and Department of Defense, so that we can wrap our arms around it. Mr. Rand, anything we can do in Congress to help you guys out? Not that I can think of right now. I would tell you that um, that in the ChemBio S and T world for science and technology, one of our top priorities is the finding an integrated early warning system and process um, to do just what Dr. Hopkins had talked about because just finding what is out there and knowing it's coming is, is critical. So um, I would expect our work would progress in that area. Anything to add, Mr. Berger? Nothing other than just I think the recognition of the problem is is the first step towards, you know, towards dealing with it. And I think it's important I think to we recognize, recognize it. For it. Sure. It's, it's out there. Thank you, Ms. Chairwoman. I'll yield back. Mr. Vesey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I had a, a question I wanted to ask you. I know that uh, on this committee that we've been closely monitoring uh, military readiness levels, and I'd like to hear your assessment of our current readiness levels uh, dealing with uh, chemical, biological, radio, radiological, nuclear equipment, and personnel across the DOD and other agencies. And, and any, any of you can answer that. Thank you, Congressman. Um, for the uh, traditional agents and threats uh, that we've been uh, mustered, uh, nerve, um, chemicals, uh, the known biological systems, uh, I believe that the investments that the department's been making for decades in masks, suits, gloves, individual protection, collective protection, uh, and that in all of those areas have provided a, a certain degree of readiness, an adequate degree of readiness for encountering those, uh, those classical agents. In the area of emerging threats, emerging infectious diseases, uh, synthetically, synthetic biology, engineered uh, diseases, I don't, think we're in, I don't think we know how good we are or how bad we are, and that's an area that where, we, where we are focusing and we have to continue to focus. Uh, also, uh, <coughs> wanted to switch to uh, Middle East and North Africa, I wanted to uh, ask if you could discuss how the current events there are impacting uh, DTRA's operations and planning, and have you received any additional requests for support from CENTCOM and AFRICOM, and what are some of your largest concerns there? So obviously as the military campaign uh, against ISIS continues in Iraq and, and uh, Syria, ISIS is regrouping. Uh, specifically in those areas of the Middle East and North Africa. Um, Digital works with uh, partner countries in those regions to help contain and reduce those threats from terrorists that are obtaining WMD materials. Uh, that could certainly destabilize um, those regions and lead to large refugee flows. Um, in countries uh, where there's active ongoing violence, such as in Iraq, our CTR operations have been curtailed uh, significantly. Um, and our engagements have been limited to VTC uh, instead of being able to go there in person. Uh, in countries where violence is sporadic and the security situation is delicate such, delicate, such as in Lebanon and Jordan, our CTR operations have continued to provide the security environment. Um, that, that environment is stable enough for our operations, uh, but we've encountered delays, uh, but they've been short in duration. Um, so our... In essence, our work there has been limited because we're always focused on the safety of our people before we send them over there, and, and so that limits us of what we can do. 
Well, thank you very much. And wanted to also uh, ask one more question related to Ebola. Uh, you know, we had one of the uh, more high profile cases in Dallas County, which is an uh, area that I represent. And wanted to know what lessons that you feel that we've learned that have been put into practice uh, and how would you assess the DOD's ability to respond similarly uh, in, in future cases? Um, I'll comment on that. <clears throat> on that. First thing, I think the what DOD brings to a, a situation like like the Ebola outbreak is our <clears throat> pardon me, our organizational ability, our planning ability, our logistics, uh, and those sorts of things. Uh, I think we learned from the uh, the Ebola outbreak uh, the necessity of of having the capacity to transport folks. You know, we made an investment in some uh, uh, the patient trans uh, transportable. Um, pods that could be put into our military uh, medical evacuation aircraft to do things like that. But I think the, pri the primary thing is early detection. I think the earlier we can recognize that that is what the problem is and the earlier we can get ahead of the, ahead of the curve on trying to, to deal with the problem is probably where we're at. And so I think our, our efforts in, in early detection and warning of uh, outbreaks is probably where our best investment can be made. Thank you. Madam Chair, are you back? Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Chairwoman Stefanik. And uh, thank each of you for being here today and on these important issues. And, and indeed, our subcommittee has been very fortunate to have uh, Sandia fellow Katie Sutton here. Uh, in fact, uh, she brings good news and bad news. Last year, she brought bad news, uh, but it, it needed to be addressed. And, and her professionalism has certainly come through. Uh, last year, we had the mishandling of the live anthrax samples uh, that were sent from Dugway to 86 government and private labs and other facilities in the United States and seven other countries, Australia, Britain, Canada, Germany, Italy, Japan, and South Korea. Uh, Mr. Berger, what is the status of the report requested in FY17 NDAA regarding the mishandling of the anthrax shipments? What is the status of any corrective actions that have been put in place to make sure this type of incident is prevented in the future, and what efforts are being taken within the department to reduce the amount of select agent number of labs that handle select agents? And this could be answered really by anybody, anyone, but if you would begin. I'm, I'm afraid I'll have to, I would have to get back to you on that because I don't know the, uh, the details, uh, but I will provide that to you. And Ms. Duran, Dr. Hopkins. Uh, on the status of the report, I'll have to get that, that answer for you. If I could take that for the record, I'll, uh, I'll, we'll get that status. As far as what the agents, what the uh, department's done, uh, we recognized as a result of those, uh, those inadvertent shipments that uh, the handling of, uh, of those agents was being done in different chains of command, and there was not unity of effort or unity of oversight. Uh, over the years. And so one of the things, I think the most significant thing that the Deputy Secretary did is he designated the Secretary of the Army as the executive agent for all work with biological select agents. And that has had a, a unifying effect and it has had a, uh, introduced a certain amount of discipline into, uh, into the process. Uh, they're responsible for reviewing and inspecting all of the laboratories that handle the biological select agents and toxins. And they've also uh, looked outside themselves. They've gone to uh, establish an expert panel to review the procedures, such as the ones that, uh, that didn't work uh, at Dugway. And so uh, we're, uh, I think we're in much better shape than we were two years ago on this, primarily because of that action. There have been a number of actions below that in order to introduce more discipline and, uh, and care at the laboratory level. But I think the most significant thing was establishing the Secretary of the Army as the department's executive agent for overseeing all work with those select agents. I have nothing further to add. And, and uh, again, uh, Katie Sutton was just terrific, bringing this to our attention, monitoring this. Uh, her professionalism always comes through, and we're going to miss her as she uh, departs uh, for uh, another great assignment. Uh, additionally, um, for um, uh, Ms. Durand, uh, Dr. Hopkins, the FY17 supplemental budget request included a supplemental increase of $127 million 
dollars for the chemical demilitarization program due to engineering challenges and increased contract cost. Can you explain the justification for this additional request? What is the impact if this funding is not received? Will the program be able to complete all required destruction by the 2023 deadline? What mitigation steps are being put in place for this program to prevent further cost and schedule overruns? Uh, thank you, Congressman, for that question. Just uh, for some context on this, the uh, chemical demilitarization program in the United States is, uh, is working on it, uh, eliminating the last 10 percent of what the United States declared to the Chemical Weapons uh, Convention. Uh, that would be, uh, we declared 30,000 tons several years ago, and this Assembled Chemical Weapons Alternatives Program is the program that uh, it has the two sites, one in Kentucky, one in Colorado. And uh, there has been major progress at both of those sites. In Pueblo, they've started operations. In Bluegrass, they're, uh, they're going through systemization. There is a request in the supplemental for additional uh, resources, and that is uh, primarily to recover some schedule uh, in order to make, the, to make sure that we make the 2023. And uh, it actually, in large-scale processes like these, the more we can invest up front, the higher the likelihood is that it's, that it's going to reduce the life cycle cost for this. Uh, the need for the, uh, for the increase was really due to a, a number of factors. Uh, primarily, uh, we did not anticipate uh, the fact that the first-of-a-kind technologies that are being used at both locations uh, would require uh, so much rework. Uh, and uh, I could go into gory detail on some of the things like redoing welds and so forth. But in both cases, in both Pueblo and in Bluegrass, uh, there has been un unexpected, unplanned need for some additional rework in order to get the systems up and running. And when I say we didn't anticipate, I can be very specific. We didn't anticipate last year, because last year, uh, in an attempt to reduce the amount of money that the program carried over from one year to another, the Aqua program gave money back, returned money so they could be rephased in the out years. And so as a result, uh, at the same time we're returning the money so they can be rephased in later years, the need for this, uh, this rework, the emerging uh, uh, challenges also appeared, and that resulted in an actual need for the money in 17. So what we're essentially trying to do is put <coughs> back into 17 that we had reprogrammed into the out years in order to make sure that we make the 2023 schedule. Thank you very much. Ms. Cheney. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, thank you very much to our witnesses for being here today. Uh, I wanted to, to dig a little deeper in terms of what we're doing to protect our war fighters, and in particular, um, the extent to which we're uh, facing increasing threats on the ground in Iraq and Syria. Uh, Mr. Verga, maybe we could start with you. Just in terms of the um, uh, assurances that you feel, the confidence that you feel that we're in a position where we're, we're providing uh, our men and women in uniform with, with the very best possible protection against the growing threat that they, that they may be facing on the battlefield uh, from these types of weapons? Well, we have a great deal of confidence in, in, the, in the equipment and the training that our uh, forces have in order to deal with these threats. I mean, it's one that we've recognized over time, made significant investments in, in our ability to, to counter those threats, uh, and are, <clears throat> excuse me, are now working uh, with our uh, partners and allies in the area to, in fact, um, to in fact provide to uh, the allies, to the Iraqis and to the Kurds, uh, equipment through uh, cooperative programs that, that Ditcher and Dr. Hopkinson speak to a little bit more in detail to be able to be able to deal with those. Again, I think it's uh, a, the importance is recognizing the threat. I mean, the ISIS has in fact used. Uh, both um, chemical weapons and uh, toxic industrial chemicals in, you know, against, uh, against our forces and, and against the, uh, our, our allied forces there. I don't know if you had anything. Yeah. Um, thank you. In addition, uh, we are making sure that our laboratories, such as Edgewood in Maryland, uh, the way where they actually do challenge uh, our ability to protect the warfighter with masks and suits and gloves. We're making sure that the, the things that we, we're giving the warfighters are effective against what we believe to be the actual materials that are being used in the field. Just add a little bit more, and Ditra's specific role in the science piece of that um, 
our chemical and biological um, folks get a lot of feedback um, from the joint program office on how our how the development that we did how that's actually working. Another great program that we have is a scientist in the foxhole program, and we we take our scientists who are working on the initial phases of developing that equipment that will give the best protection to the warfighter. We send those scientists out into the field with the warfighter so they can get that immediate feedback, and that helps them tremendously in understanding as they're doing the research and the scientific work what they need to what works for the warfighter and what doesn't. So that's proven to be very successful. And just to follow up, uh, in terms of the uh, increasing capabilities that we're facing from our adversaries in these areas, um, could you provide a little bit of information about the extent to which our technology and ability to defend against what we're seeing and, and the increasing availability of some of these weapons, um, whether you feel that we're keeping up sufficiently in terms of the, the progress that's being made by, by our enemy. I, my, my hesitation is I'm trying to think if, if in an unclassified format we can talk about where we are in that uh, I think I would prefer to defer that because uh, we couldn't get into any real specifics. All right, that's fine. Thank you. And then um, I just wanted to follow up on uh, where we are on the national biodefense implementation and strategy. I know you're going to be coming back to us in September of this year. Um, but if you could talk a little bit about sort of the preliminary work that's been done and, and you know, how you think things are going based on the requirement in the last NDAA. Uh, thank you. The uh, of course, the Department of Homeland Security is leading that review. We in the Department of Defense are cooperating with them, along with HHS and Department of Agriculture and, and many other organizations. Um, we did uh, provide a briefing to, some, to staff on, on where we're at on it. And uh, as, as you said, the, the report is due in September, and we'll think we'll be able to, to, to deliver that on time. Thank you very much. Uh, you're back. Mr. Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ma'am, gentlemen, thank you for your service to the country. And uh, my question gets back to our inter interaction with uh, other countries that we may not necessarily share values with, but we share interests with. Um, obviously, uh, the country of Russia comes to mind. Russia and the United States uh, were key to the uh, getting Syria to destroy uh, their chemical weapons. How much dialogue do you have with um, counterparts in other countries about what the most pressing threats are and the most pressing, the most uh, efficient ways to uh, eliminate those threats? I, I would describe the, the interaction we have with our, with our allies and friends uh, as robust. Um, we have a... Uh, if I may, I'm also talking about people that we don't consider to be allies or friends, but that we may have a shared interest with uh, in this particular field. Yeah, I'd have, to, I'd, have to, I'd, have to, I'd have to check on that one, sir. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have that right offhand. I'd, I'd be interested in your, in your answer if you think that perhaps that's something that we should pursue. Um, if you would, then uh, go ahead with our allies and friends, if you would. Um, with our allies, we do have a, um, a robust cooperative program with, uh, with them, so, uh, cooperative research and development programs, uh, working very closely with, uh, you know, with particularly our NATO allies and, and also uh, others to be able to, to share information regarding the threats uh, and regarding, uh, regarding the countermeasures. I know uh, Dr. Hopkins can talk a little bit more about some of the specific programs. Uh, yes, in, in addition to the uh, sharing information about the potential threats, we have very uh, active, uh, detailed engagements with their closest allies on, uh, on mitigations and uh, identifying ways to protect, uh, protect us, and especially in the NATO scenario where we actually you know, we have a common standard for the performance of uh, various countermeasures. So it's uh, the closest ally is very strong uh, and very effective, helpful to us. I would be interested in your comments as well, all of your comments about whether or not this is something that, that we should look into, how we, uh, whether we should or should not potentially share information uh, with countries where we have that shared interest, if you will, even though we don't share values. I know that the issue with Syria, for example, is one where uh, it took an agreement 
um, with, with Russia to actually get uh, those, those weapons destroyed. But with that, uh, Madam Chair, I look forward to the written response, and I thank you for your, uh, your service to the country, and I yield back the remainder of my time. Thank you. We'll now go to the second round of questions for members who are able to. Um, my, my question is a follow-up, Ms. Duran, to uh, Mr. Vizi's line of questioning. And in your testimony, you highlighted Detroit's growing activities in the Middle East and Northern Africa, both in the context of support to Operation Inherent Resolve and the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program. But can you discuss how DITRA prioritizes which nations receive support, and how does DITRA leverage other government agencies in these efforts? I can. Thank you. Um, a lot of our priorities come from the uh, two offices um, that Mr. Verga and uh, Dr. Hopkins represent. So it, it, um, the priorities flow from the uh, Department of Defense down through the Office of the Secretary of Defense um, in our own internal planning for our priorities, we have a lot of interaction with the combatant commands, so we get a lot of our uh, priority input from them. We have our own robust strategic planning process within the agency and determining what are the greatest threats, what are those priorities, uh, and then as we build our budgets, we focus on those. Uh, but all those are fed um, through other avenues throughout the department. And, and then how does DITRA leverage other government agencies in these efforts? So that part is uh, critical to us. We have very robust partnerships um, across the interagency. There are various things um, that the Department of State does with us uh, related to the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program. Um, we would mentioned before Health and Human Services. They do a lot of work, so we are constantly coordinating and synchronizing and making sure that um, no one is duplicating efforts. And in essence, it ends up being the leveraging of capabilities across the entire government so everyone knows where their lanes are uh, and they can focus on those, um, their specific areas of expertise. Um, it is clear that there are growing uh, needs of support. And what are your concerns about the growing need for this support? Support in the region. Just Can I take that one for the record? I'm Absolutely. On that. Thank you. Um, I will recognize Mr. Langevin for his second round of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, thanks to our witnesses. Uh, Dr. Hopkins, uh, as you know, for the last two years, I have uh, followed the program uh, Constellation. And the, uh, the program is being uh, resourced by the Office of Secretary of Defense and executed by DITRA to uh, fulfill a STRATCOM requirement. Although, uh, I, I must say it's worth noting, uh, our committee uh, never heard uh, directly from STRATCOM on this particular uh, need or program, which I found curious. Uh, but uh, now that the uh, CWMD synchronization role uh, has transferred from STRATCOM to SOCOM, uh, how is the Department clarifying situational awareness requirements of that command? Thank you for the question. It's, uh, it's especially timely. Uh, as, uh, as you probably could tell from the testimony, the, uh, we have discontinued the prototype that was called Constellation, uh, primarily due to the limitation of funds that was in the uh, NDAA draft and in the final language. Um, having said that, though, uh, the requirement for situational awareness is as strong or stronger than it ever has been. The commander of, uh, of SOCOM has, uh, has said more than once that he has a very firm, strong need for a common intelligence and common operating pictures, and that is the essence of what situational awareness is, and that's, that's the essence of what the Constellation prototype was intended to, to provide. Uh, two things are happening. One is uh, your language uh, in the NDAA basically asked us to do a have an independent look at the uh, at the system, the requirements, and the plans, and we're doing that. We've hired a federally funded research and development uh, company to uh, go ahead and uh, objectively look at requirements, including uh, the ones that you referenced might have uh, might have come from Stratcom at the time, but the the requirements for all the combatant commanders for situational awareness of WMD-related things. And our plan is to take the resources that we have and any future resources and work with STRATCOM and work with DITRA and adapt those uh, parts of that 
where we did learn especially useful things from the constellation and adapt them to the common intelligence and the common operating picture that SOCOM needs in order to perform their function as the synchronizer. So we are, we're in the process of, of doing that. We'll get the requirements and the plans, for, in other words, work with the FFRDC, and then also adapt what we have directly to the needs of the, uh, of the combatant commander. So how under-resourced were you that you had to, uh, for the program, that you had to cancel it? Uh, trusting my memory here, about $25 million. So are you, are you saying that you're coming up with a, a replacement program, Constellation Light, or is it? Uh, uh, I, I don't know what we call it yet. Uh, we're looking at the requirements, and we're going to work with SOCOM and DITRA to understand what, is, what would be the most useful and, uh, and helpful ways to obtain and depict situational awareness of people, places, and things in the, in the various theaters having to do with weapons of mass destruction, what would be most useful to the warfighter in the field. And w what form that takes, I, I'm not quite sure yet. But we did learn a lot from, uh, from doing the Constellation. So the plan this year is to use the funds we have to do that, and then recovering next year, and then investing more in those things that are useful to, uh, to SOCOM. OK, well, we know that the requirement hasn't gone away. It's the funding Correct. that's the problem. So Sir. thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Vega, uh, what, uh, what process is the department using uh, to ensure uh, the transition of necessary resources from STRATCOM to SOCOM for the CWMD mission? Uh, has the hiring freeze impacted the ability of SOCOM or DITRA to bring uh, people into key positions during the transition? And for Mr. Rand, uh, how has the transition been uh, for DITRA? Uh, what uh, have been the challenges and opportunities identified? So, Mr. Vega. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, there has not been any issues uh, that have been identified by, by SOCOM to as far as the transition goes. Uh, I know they went, uh, had their initial operation, operational capability in January to do that. Uh, and as far as I know, they're, uh, they're, they're moving right along. Uh, the normal budgetary process in terms of transferring of, uh, transferring of resources is the, one, is the one that we're using. Uh, if I could take this opportunity, I may have misspoke when I was talking about uh, ISIS use of chemical weapons. I believe I may have said that they had used them against U.S. forces. That's not, uh, not true right now. Right now, it's only been Iraqi civilians uh, and Iraqi forces that they have used chemical weapons against, and I'd like to correct that if I could. Thank you. So for the, uh, the transition from STRATCOM to SOCOM, I will address how it is impacted. Um, DITRA, first I will say our relationship with SOCOM is tremendous. We've had a long-standing relationship with them, uh, and that has grown even stronger. Uh, last December, General Thomas gathered up the entire interagency and DOD members and talked about, got their input for the, his overall plan, so he learned from that. We had a global synchronization conference uh, last month in bringing in all the interagency. He laid out his initial thoughts on the global campaign plan that he is developing, and he was gaining everyone's input on that. So that has been going very well. Specifically to the agency, under STRATCOM, the director of DITRA was dual-hatted as the director of STRATCOM's Center for Com uh, Countering WMD. Um, SOCOM is not following that um, organizational model, which is just fine. We still have most of the same people within the agency, so they're the SOCOM element um, with us, and that, that partnership is continuing, and they're really, um, if anything, it's grown even stronger with um, General Thomas's uh, and his entire staff's active participation in that. So I will tell you, I think it is going uh, exceptionally well. Okay. Very good. Thank you. I have other questions that I'll submit for the record, and uh, if you could respond to those in writing, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Langevin, and uh, thank you so much to all of our witnesses, Dr. Hopkins, Mr. Verga, and Ms. Duran, for your expertise and testimony today. Uh, and, and no further questions from the committee members? I adjourn this hearing.